Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. Each week, we address issues of timely and timeless concern with newsmakers and the journalists who report on them, with artists, writers, scientists, educators, social scientists, government leaders. We speak to each one to one. I'm delighted to welcome Megan Healy, award winning costume and set designer whose work has been seen in theater, opera, and film productions in New York City and around the country, and who is teaching those skills as assistant professor of costume and scenic design at Queens College of the City University of New York. This semester, she and her students have gone underground, where they are interviewing the city's subway riders and collecting stories about their below-ground experiences for a play that will use puppets and is based on Dante's Inferno. It's called Subterraneo, A Cruel Puppet's Guide to Underground Living. And Healy says the stories collected so far are funny, profane, and moving. Welcome. Thank you. Your parents were not in the theater. So how did you develop an interest in theater? Um, you know, something that I say to my students a lot about people who want to pursue a career in theater is that I think that in many ways, as much as it's a profession, theater is also a calling. Um, and that people who feel that calling begin at a very young age. Um, I read an article in the newspaper when I was five about the Virginia Shakespeare Festival having public auditions that they were opening to the public. They were doing a medieval mystery play called St. George and the Dragon, which is a very well-known early play. And they were opening it up to the public and they were using members of the community. And I read it in the newspaper when I was five. I asked my parents if I could go and audition because it seemed like something new and exciting. I had always liked games of pretend. A constant complaint from my school growing up was that I wouldn't get out of the dress-up corner. I wouldn't stop making up my stories long enough to do my math work and so forth. So um, I, I asked my parents if I could go. And of course, my parents, not being theater people, had no idea what they were getting themselves into. So they they did agree we'll to take her. me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think if they had known what the future would bring, they, they might not have done it. But um, my father took me to the audition. And he had to read a Shakespearean sonnet, um, which he was really horrified about, a five-year-old doing something like that. So. He was rehearsing with me in the hallway, and all these adults were going in and giving these really terrible auditions and couldn't pronounce the words, and my father was helping me. And he, at the same time, he kept trying to urge me to leave and saying, isn't this line long? Aren't you tired? Wouldn't, we can go, like we should leave. But I wanted to stay because I wanted to have my turn. And when I finally had my turn, um, to the amazement of everyone, because there weren't actually children there, it was mostly adults and teenagers, uh, I actually read the whole sonnet pronounced all the words and did a really good job. And so they created a, a part for me in the play because they didn't really have parts for children. And so they made me a jester. And I, I only had a few lines. I had a really great jester costume and a mask, which was my favorite part about it. And from that time on, I was... You had the theater bug. Yes, I was in love with the theater. I, I did all the community theater that I could growing up. Um, I got really lucky. For about eight years, we lived in a town called Geneva, New York, and they had a really wonderful children's theater program. And I um, owe a lot to the man who ran that program because I was in the shows every summer. I loved it. I was in all the plays at school. I loved theater. And what was it that appealed to you? I loved the idea, especially in community theater where we would be with adult actors. I loved the camaraderie of theater. And um, I've always felt at home in the theater, ever since the first time. I've always felt like I walk into a theater and I feel like I'm this is where I belong. coming home. Yeah. And so I loved, I also loved that the adults involved were forced to play these games with us. As a child, that was very appealing. Like I was used to doing pretend games or playing with my brothers and sisters, but now it was like somebody gave us costumes, somebody built us a set, and then all these people had to come and pretend and, and make this world real and, and you were doing it with them and that was always very exciting to me. It was never even so much the audience or the applause but that I loved that everybody had to participate and be part of this pretend world mm -hmm. or, or made up world that we were making together. Well I'm certainly impressed that you were reading the paper at five, <laughs> uh, that you spotted this you know, audition call and that you were able to read a Shakespeare sonnet at five. Yes. That's pretty impressive. 
<laughs> well, I, I, I loved reading. I always loved reading and books growing up. And that, that was all part of loving stories and pretend. And yeah, so that it began very early. So when you went to college at mm -hmm. Emory, Atlanta, it was not with the intention of studying theater, however, it was with the yeah. intention of studying law. Yes. I, I knew actually by the time I was a senior in high school, I still loved theater. And I deliberately chose Emory because they had an extremely strong theater program. And at the time, it wasn't my intention to major in theater. So I made sure that there were ways to do theater that you didn't have to be a theater major. And, um, but it was my intention to go to law school and to study law. So I started out and I was a political science and Near Eastern studies major. And I was studying Arabic and I was studying Near Eastern history and politics. Um, and over the course of that year, I knew I didn't want to be a professional actor. And at the time, I, my experience was so limited that I didn't know there were other jobs other than being a professional actor. But what became clear to me after my first year of school was that what I felt most passionate about wasn't going to law school, which actually had ceased to be of interest to me after the first few weeks of school, but actually the stuff I was doing in the theater and the shows. And that was what I wanted to spend all my time doing. And I kept trying to make up ways how I could be a lawyer and still do theater on the side, or like maybe I would get discovered and then I wouldn't go to law school. And I, I came to the realization that probably instead of just like waiting to be discovered at law school, that I should actually just find something in theater that I was really good at and pursue theater as my career and put my passion into it. And so that was what I did. And how the, how the transition from acting to design? Well, I was still acting in the shows, but I, hadn't, I knew I didn't want to be an actor. I just knew that that wasn't my milieu. So I started to explore other aspects of theater. And Emory has a very um, collaborative program that's very oriented towards the students learning all aspects of theater. So we wrote plays, we directed plays, we designed plays, we, we collaborated in our student theater groups, we had the opportunity to work on shows for Theater Emory, and there were also all of these seminars that they would have about different aspects of theater. And what happened was, I the second year when I had decided to major in theater, I started taking the technical theater course that they offer there. And so I started building sets, and I found that I really liked it. And I really liked painting, and I really liked conceiving the sets and building them and working on them, and I, also made money uh, in a part-time job working as an electrician for the lighting designer, and I found all of that really fascinating. And I happened to go to a seminar that featured Ming Cho Lee and John Conklin speaking about the future of design. And they were showing their work, and they were talking about how designers think and how they work and what they really do and how they influence a show. And I started to, it just clicked for me in that moment watching the seminar that that was really what I wanted to do mm -hmm. and that those professionals were doing something that combined all the things that I really liked about theater because you can't be a costume designer and not love acting and actors and what they do. You work so closely with them. Right. You help them to physicalize the emotional work that they're doing on a script and you have to think like a director, and I really liked directing. You have to think about how to solve the problems of the play through visual media. And you had to be a dramaturg and do lots of research, which I loved. So I realized that that was what really combined all of my interests. And so from that point on, which was about October of my sophomore year, I just started single-mindedly pursuing design and mm -hmm. taking drawing class, taking all the design classes I could, right. building all the sets that I could get my hands on, helping to build other people's sets, um, and starting to solicit work from other people in Atlanta. So so you graduate from Emory. Yes. And you come to New York. Yes. To NYU, to their yes. theater program. And how did you get your career started? Yeah, how did you find work as a designer? Is, is, is it is, you know, we, we know it's notoriously hard for actors to find sure. work in the theater. How about as a, as a designer? It is just as hard for designers to find that big break. Um, I guess I would describe it as a combination of really, really hard work and good fortune, which was that I worked really hard and scrounged and worked on any play that anybody <laughs> would offer me for $50 in a metro card I would design their show. And I did things for the Fringe Festival in its early years. Um, lots of off, 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 off Broadway shows, small shows, 
And what happened was, as with designers, as with actors, I started to build a reputation. And so slowly, slowly, slowly over those years, I started to get bigger and more important projects. And then I started to work with directors whose careers started to take off. Yes. And then I started to work with them in regional theaters. And so that grew another part of my career. And I also dabbled in other things, like I did a TV movie for PBS. and. Um, that was that was actually because the woman who was the production designer went to school with me and she really liked me and she was doing this biography of F. Scott Fitzgerald with all these reenactments that needed costumes so mm -hmm. she offered to have me do it and that exposed me to another market and so everything sort of grew out of everything else but most of all just by working hard doing the best that I possibly could with each project and also by connections making friendships making connections to other designers, other right. directors, did other you ha were, were you able to support yourself doing this? Or did you have to do a waitressing job or secretarial no, I've, jobs? No, I've or? actually never waited tables. I did work for a time in a company that doesn't exist anymore, Dodger Costume Shop. And I was uh, an assistant designer in-house, and that meant that I went shopping for things and helped designers who came to build their shows, their big Broadway shows. So I've worked on some crazy things like Little Mermaid on Ice, they did while we were there. And the big question was, how does, does a mermaid wear ice skates? Uh, if she well, has her no fish's feet, tail. How does she skate? <laughs> um, that was a big problem that had to be solved. Um, I had the chance to work a little bit on Footloose, the Broadway musical, mm -hmm. with Tony Leslie James, who probably doesn't remember me at all, but I was there. I, was, I, went, I did all the shopping. And then I was a shopper, and I also, um, they had a rental house. They had all the old costumes, and they would rent them to schools and people so sometimes I would work in the rental house and somebody would call up and say, we're doing Kiss Me Kate. And so it would be my job to design a traditional sort of production of Kiss Me Kate using the costumes that we had mm -hmm. and make sure that they fit everybody. And that was actually a really interesting learning experience too because you didn't have total artistic freedom because it wasn't like you could make anything you wanted to. It had to be made out of the costumes that we had in the right. warehouse. And, but we did have all of these extraordinary costumes. So you had this artistic freedom, this crazy freedom. For one week, you would just be totally immersed in these shows. And so I became very familiar with all these shows like South Pacific we used to do all the time and right. Kiss Me Kate was another one that we used to do all the time. We used to dread it when people would rent 42nd Street because there's like three different versions of it so it would be like oh my god you know which mm -hmm. which dance numbers are in this version and right. what do they want to do and like is this costume too ripped and and so it was a crazy experience. So I worked in the rental house to support and then, and then I could rent things for free okay. for my shows. <laughs> okay. Well we're going to take a short break okay. and then we'll come right back and we'll talk about what you're doing at Queens. Great. Okay. I'm lucky. Let me help you with that. I get to do something I love. It has nothing to do with touchdowns or titles. Everybody bring it in. I get to play a part in the life of someone just starting out. How many of you think homework is just as important as teamwork? I help keep kids in school. Good. And that's the name of the game. My name is LaDainian Thomason. I don't just wear the shirt. I live it. Give. Advocate. Volunteer. Live United. Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York, and I'm speaking with Megan Healy, Assistant Professor of Costume and Scenic Design at Queens College. Are there a lot of students majoring in theater these days? Um, we have about 60 majors, um, which doesn't sound like a lot, but we service actually thousands of students who take our different classes for different reasons. Um, I think a lot of students are concerned, and it's a question we actually get from a lot of prospective freshmen is, what can I do if I major in theater? What job can I get? And obviously the economy is on everyone's mind, so students want to know why would I major in theater or what kind of jobs can I get? Um, the fact of the matter is, you know, I really think that people who are called to do this work or people who have a passion for it are going to do it, regardless right. of the economic situation. Sort of like whether you're in journalism or whether the ministry sure. or, or art. I mean, let's face it, even working at Goldman Sachs these days isn't a for sure job that, you know, that you might think are in finance. So we say to students, well, the economy is bad, so, so you might not be able to do anything depending on what it is. But if your passion is theater, then you should pursue it. Mm -hmm. um, but I think one reason that we still get a lot of students who take our classes is that 
theater classes do have a value even for students who don't necessarily have any intention of becoming theater artists. One thing that I tell students about my design class, which also fulfills one of our core requirements of our general education curriculum, is that taking these classes is about learning to think in a different way. Um, when you take a design class, you think using your visual brain, which is different than what we're used to using our verbal brain, using words to express ideas. In a design class, you use images to express ideas. So you're opening up a whole other part of your consciousness and trying to tap into things that are in your brain and essentially use creative problem solving. And what I say to a lot of the kids in the beginning level class is that it really doesn't matter what your major is. It can be chemistry or journalism or history or theater, creative problem solving is a skill that anybody can use. And so by taking these classes that sort of stretch your abilities or push you to think in ways that you've never done before is a way of training your brain to think creatively and to be able to expand your personal knowledge. What don't people know about scenic design that would surprise them? Uh, I think what people don't know about scenic design is that nothing that you find on stage or in the audience is ever an accident. Even the choice to have a play in a proscenium theater is a choice that gets debated and discussed endlessly. Every thing on stage is deliberately chosen and selected to enhance your point of view about a play. And I also think that a lot of times people don't realize how strongly design influences how they feel about a production or a play. And, and how, how they much, experience it. Yes, how, how much it uh, actually subconsciously informs you about what you're watching and how the artists who created it want you to feel about what you're watching. You say that puppetry mm -hmm. is one of the oldest and most subversive performing traditions. Yes. Tell us about that. Um, well, puppetry is actually one of mankind's most ancient art forms. They've found evidence of terracotta puppets in Greece, um, in Aztec civilization and other Native American civilizations. Um, the earliest puppets were totems or fetishes that were used by shamans or witch doctors in early tribal cultures. So for a long time, human beings have had this impulse to recreate themselves in this art form that has grown and evolved into puppetry. Um, in a lot of cultures, Puppetry was one of the last refuges of political satire. Puppets could say things that people might be jailed or even executed for saying, but puppetry, and because they were puppets, they could get away with it. So it's always been a very political art form from the beginning, even things like Punch and Judy, all the way up to today when we have bread and puppet theater and things like that. So it's always been a very um, sort of outspoken art form mm -hmm. where people ha can say things that they might not be able to say even in a play. Now I know that I have at least two plays on Broadway now, I think of Avenue Q mm -hmm. and The Lion King yes. that use puppets. Yes. And I mean is is that the reason they use them because the puppets can say things that they're not going to say or is it for some other reason? And I think in Avenue Q it definitely is that the puppets can say things that people can't say or watching the puppets say something outrageous is, you know, allows us a certain emotional distance from what's being said so that we can laugh at it, but it also sort of we're taken aback, especially in Avenue Q where they're sort of playing on a satire of those traditional childhood kind of puppet shows like Sesame Street where the puppets teach us a lesson and here the puppets are saying these kind of outrageous, naughty, subversive things that maybe we're all thinking. And even having sex. I saw yes. some puppets having sex on stage. <laughs> yes, and the puppets are doing things that we think puppets shouldn't do. Um, so I think they're being deliberately satirical. Uh, with Lion King, I think what Julie Taymor was trying to achieve was she had a musical where people had to be animals. So does she take sort of a traditional stuffed animal head kind of root? And in that, I think she sort of rejected the idea of that, but tried to create a world where we could accept that a man singing is actually a giraffe. Mm -hmm. And our imagination takes us to that place through the use of mask and puppetry. We accept that like this character is a lion. But obviously the lion is also a person. You know, there's a story that's sort of a human story. So I think she's exploring that through puppetry and letting our imaginations take you over and make it more believable to us in a way that we're telling this story about a lion and a snake and mm -hmm. a, you know, et cetera. What was the genesis of the subway puppetry piece you are putting together now? 
Um, you know, as an artist, I've been living in New York City now for almost 15 years and taking the train for that whole time. I've actually never owned a car. Um, and so I ride the train at all hours of the night and day. And, you know, as a result, anyone who can ride the subway at 2 a.m. will tell you that most outrageous things happen on the subway and can happen at any time of the night or day. So, um, you know, I was sometimes I would tell my friends these stories of things that would happen to me on the train. And, you know, being theater people, people kept saying to me, you should make a play about the things that happened to you. You should make a crazy play about all the stuff that's happened to you on the subway. And in the past couple of years, I've become interested in wanting to do some of my own work. Uh, as a designer, I do a lot of new plays, and I really enjoy that, and I find it very satisfying. But in the last couple of years, I've started to think about what could I do that would be my own original work. And so I sort of, it came to me one day as an inspiration, like not long after a friend had said something like that to me about one of my stories about riding the train, I thought, you know, I should make a play about riding on the train. And then I started to think about how would I do that, and would I just tell my own stories? And then I, that got me interested in the idea of trying to get other people's stories mm -hmm. because I felt like there's a lot of great stories out there about the subway that are sort of happening every day. And how the puppets fit and where, how do puppets fit into this? My interest in puppetry has been growing in the last couple of years as well. And that just came together as a synergy where I felt like maybe this is the right story to be told through puppetry mm -hmm. because of the surreal quality of the story, because of the outrageousness of the story. Um, and it would be wonderful to merge my interest in puppetry with my desire to tell these stories about the subway. And so it seemed like a natural fit to me, the two things. So you have students out there now yes. who are interviewing people in the subways, yes. right? How, how long have they been out there? How long are they going to be out there? They're going to be out there at least uh, through the middle of June. And they've been out there since the end of February. Um, they've been going out there every day, interviewing people on the trains, on the platforms, on the street, uh, trying to collect interviews. We'd like to collect as many as possible. We've got about 30 or 40 interviews now. Between, We also have a Facebook page, which is Cruel Puppet Collective on Facebook. And we've had people write in with their stories there onto our discussion mm -hmm. board. We have a blog called The Cruel Puppet Collective. And we have the students collecting stories, just interviewing people, using video cameras and small microphones on the subway. Mm -hmm. So you want you have one of the, your characters here, yes, right? Yes, I do. Who's this? Um, this is Homeless Bob. Ah, uh, yes, I rec I've seen him. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people have said, I know him. He's on the A train. Um, so this is Homeless Bob. He's one of the main characters of the story. We have two main characters. One is the commutrix, who is a silent, everyman character. Um, and as you mentioned at the beginning, the, the play is based on Dante's Inferno. So Homeless Bob is actually the Virgil character, the sort of guide character, okay. who follows Commutrix along and kind of pushes him through the story and takes him into one place and another. We're also trying to incorporate some original music um, and covers of, there's actually a Homeless Bob Quartet, so Bob will have a backup band. Are they, do they do doo-wop They sing Paradise <laughs> City by Guns N' Roses a cappella, and that's one of our transitions into another story, so. <laughs> Are there any, any particularly, especially funny or moving stories that your students have, have found? You can let him rest All right, for I'll a while. I'll go ahead and let Bob take a break. Um, there was a really great interview that the students did with an older man who was on the train, um, and I'll just call him Gilad, and what they had interviewed him, and he'd been riding the subway for 40 years, and they asked him what was memorable about the subway, and he said that he didn't know what was memorable, but that everyone on the subway is alone. Wow. Which is true. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone is, is in their own world. And he said, everyone who is here right now is alone. Everyone sitting here is alone. And it was he just said it very simply. Um, but the audio of the interview is very powerful. We would actually like to find a way to, to use the audio in the piece. Um, but it was he, he totally, I mean, the students were really taken aback. And it really transformed our thinking in some ways to have somebody state it. In, in such a plain way, right, but right. yeah. I mean, when I think about subway stories, I sort of, I sort of think of a musical yeah. <laughs> of all these stories, you know, that, that people who are writing there, if, if you got them to get up and yeah. tell their story and sing about them, yeah. you know, I think of it as a musical. So you're going to put the, these, this, all of this together over the summer, and when yes. do you hope to produce um, a play? We are hoping that the professional production will, will 
be fully realized in spring of 2011, but we are planning on having a reading of the play, including the puppets, um, it, at Queens College in the fall so we can share the work that we've been doing with our friends and colleagues at the college who supported us. And we are also trying to have a couple of other readings of the play or performances of sections of the play in the fall of 2010. And you got to raise more money for and the And we have to raise more money. Production. We have to raise more money. Okay, well, and, and what you hope your students will get out of this? Um, what I hope my students will get out of this is, first of all, an appreciation of the playmaking process. Since many times in formal education, we use plays that are already classic plays or plays that have been produced elsewhere. I think it was a wonderful chance for my students to observe the process of actually creating a play out of nothing, out of basically just mm -hmm. an idea. Um, they've definitely learned a lot about puppet making, and they actually made their own self-portrait puppets out of found materials and created a monologue to go with their puppets. So that, I think, was sort of refreshing mm -hmm. for them. Themselves? Yeah, of themselves. Wow. Okay. And uh, so that was sort of refreshing for them and revolutionary, and, and they got really excited about that. And I think it was a really worthwhile project. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I wish I could go on, but it sounds like a lot of fun. And uh, I look forward to uh, maybe seeing the production, maybe this year, next year, this time. Yes, okay. I hope so. Thank you. I want to thank Megan Healy, Assistant Professor of Costume and Scenic Design at Queens College, for joining us today for the City University of New York and CUNY TV. I'm Cheryl McCarthy.